Finding Kinevin, Somatic Correspondences with Colour and Light. A searing golden yellow darts down the centre of the vase and glides up the other side. It is buffered on one side by two long tails of a yellow lake, perhaps a cadmium yellow with an ever so slight dash of chartreuse. It is a vivid, fluorescent light colour. The double beam shafts of light help to delineate the rim of the glass vessel before it moves along the vertical shaft directly south, where its potency becomes muted, and if one follows the capricious light, one will find it gone by the time it reaches midway down the shaft of the vase. A warmth stretches out from the base and moves up the vessel. The hues shift from golden yellow to ochre to a milky grey with bluish undertones. This warmth envelops the bottom half of the vessel, recalling a sea har on the beach, a mist that veils the boundaries of land, sea and sky, replacing such orderings of the natural world with mere suggestions of something through light and colour. A hazy horizon, a seascape reduced to the mere hint of a transition. The gradation of colours along the shaft of the vessel speak to the rocks and lichen of Munt Keridigion, and to the sea that envelops its craggy foundations. This is Ruth's Munt and her abstract glass vessels that capture her Kinevin, her habitat. Ruth Shelley is a Welsh glass artist of international acclaim. I was invited by the Makers Guild Wales to collaborate with Ruth in the creation of a new body of work inspired by dialogues that were informed by our unique creative practices and perspectives. I brought the perspective of a painter and Ruth brought the perspective of a glass worker. Our common ground was our obvious interest in colour and light. Our creative outputs had already announced our interests through the world. At our first meeting, we found we had a shared love for Munt, a coastal mount with panoramic views up and down the West Wales coast. Munt is also home to an iconic, solitary church called Eglis, a grog, the Holy Cross. The church is a Grade 1 listed building, and part of the building may have been constructed on top of a Bronze Age barrow. When Ruth introduced me to the word Kenevin, she placed her hand on her heart. Kinevin was something she didn't simply feel, but she had. It was something I had too. It was an embodied thing with historical roots written by our movements through particular landscapes of home. Kinevin indicated, amongst other things, a habitat. It was a very real, very immediate, very personal and very known thing. It was something you consciously knew and felt in the moment. When Ruth talked about Kinevin, it was stated as a word to indicate the depth of her emotional attachment to the land we walked. As a first language Welsh speaker, Ruth thought in Welsh and translated to English to converse with me, and I, as a second language Welsh speaker, appreciated the clunky movement that occurs in the brain when the grammatical flows between the two languages are reiterated through the act of translation. A sentence in Welsh is different to the flow of a sentence in English. Orders of syntax collide and often reverse. In Welsh, double affirmatives reaffirm ownership, double negatives assert the negative rather than convey a potentially diplomatic or subtle affirmative. Munt is a haven for Ruth. She visits every year and spends time with a good friend and her family. Through conversations annotated with old photographs, Ruth pointed out the darkness of the rocks, the slate grey colour and how you could see acid yellow lichen hosted on these rocks. This high contrast can be seen in some of Ruth's pieces, air, sea, rock, lichen. Through show-and-tell principles, Ruth opened folders to reveal printed portfolios of the images she'd collected over the years, an archive of embodied reference points. There were images that offered an intricate, detailed landscape, the one that lay down below Eglisogorog, amongst the nooks and crannies of the coastline. Ruth's Munt included the farmland and also the wildflowers, sea and simple campion, cuckoo flower, red clover, western gorse and more. It also included an abundance of lichen, the symbiotic specimens that form on the rocks close to the sandy beach, but also the greyish or odoniel arsenic green-like type that exists on the dry stone walls outside the church. Ruth's photos evidenced her intimate knowledge of the land, the paths and details she'd gleaned through coastal exploration. It was an intimate palette, one that mapped the lay of the land, a cartography of colour, a fluyai, a place graphia, topos graphia, colour graphia, saturated in experiential knowledge. These images, 
did not capture the munt I knew, the one I saw at the top of Moyla Munt, the Mount of Munt, where the coastline unfolds all the way to Aberystwyth, some 49 kilometres northeast as the crow flies. The top of the mound offers far-reaching views of the landscape and coastline below. This is Bay Ceredigion, a grand vista of undulation and contrast. It is a place for recalling we are islanders. This is my munt, one view from afar, one of drama and simplicity, one where a vantage point offered broad, flowing coastlines that arched, curved and stepped, masses of archaic rock jutting skywards from the sea, its true depths hidden by a blanket of roofs 108.50, 1877.30, a greenish, greyish blue. At my first studio visit, Ruth showed me a box full of her fired glass samples. I read the glass samples as a kind of toolkit and equated it with a type of palette. These were the colours she could create, that she had, through a process of experimentation, produced. In my mind, I thought of these colours as stabilised colours, domesticated colours. Each square measured roughly an inch and a half on each side. The edges were rounded and smoothed. This part was important, for I was keenly aware of the other sheets of pure glass that she used as her base material. Those were in large sheets with rough edges that were filed against the wall. Ruth's tiles were tactile pieces that afforded intimate touch, haptic engagement. The smoothness and curved edges of the tiles made them hand-friendly, and the robust quality of the thick nuggets of glass encouraged an ease of correspondence with the material. Ruth showed me one of the sheets of glass and explained the price of the piece due to its pink colour. My eyebrows rose at the cost. The piece of glass was the size of a sheet from my sketchbook. Casually, whilst talking, Ruth pulled out seven blue tiles to show me some of her colours. Intuitively, she made a pack of colour, collective noun-like groupings. A flamboyant of flamingos, a nest of rumours, a murder of crows. Some of my favourite collective nouns. How best to describe the grouping of blue tiles that now lay before me on the sideboard in Ruth's studio? My eyes moved quickly, darting from colour to colour. They were opaque and had pastel qualities. I saw eggshell green, cerulean blue, cobalt teal, king's blue, turquoise blue deep and blue grey. Through experimentation and research, Ruth had secured and held fast a colour that she could not even see until it emerged from the kiln. And she had done this over and over again in order to create her palette. If science is a systematic study, one that includes the experimentation and observation of the physical world, then Ruth's colour palette blurred the archaic line between science and art and revealed a new language of colour to me, one that I could only describe as a somewhat blind activity rooted in materials, codes, temperatures and timings. Colour transitioned from a fixed entity on my palette one that could be seen to be known, to a would-be, a potential should-be, to an anticipatory colour, one to expect, to await, to predict. Colour only becomes actual to Ruth once the lid of the kiln is lifted and she finds out if all her research has held her in good stead, if her calculations and deductions have held her through another firing. Her pattern vessels took on a different shape in my mind. I thought of the jigsaw puzzle of pattern and should-be colour, of stretch and hue, of height and thickness. Like the reversal of syntax, the toing and froing between the visual and the mathematical requires a sharp mind, the need to occupy a sort of cognitive space where the science of colour collides in the mind's eye, not a colour of imagination, but a colour of knowing. Later at home, whilst playing with collective nouns in my mind, I noticed in the photographs that each tile had a little white sticker in one corner, and I zoomed in closer and studied further find that these numbers were often three or four digits. Having spent the morning in her studio, I was in no doubt that Ruth fired layers of glass, and I suspected that the sets of numbers directly correlated with the layers of glass she used in order to create the colour. Ruth had layered two separate sheets of glass and then fired them together to achieve a single pure colour. There were rules in her quest for colours that had to be abided. Whilst Ruth could layer the glass, often one opaque layer and one transparent, or one opaque and two transparent pieces, any more than three layers, and the glass will get murky and one colour will overtake. In light of this predicament, Ruth explained that it is important to understand the percentages of each colour. When mixing colours to create certain shades, she observed that you've got to know your colours in glass. In the early summer, early June, I asked Ruth about the numbers. Ruth explained, each colour of glass has a number as a name. I remember numbers. 
I have a mathematical brain, it's shorthand, so I'll know which piece of glass will work. If I see colour anywhere, I put references down. I explored this point further with Ruth. I was interested in the idea that Ruth sees colours and makes numbers, that she looks at colours in the field, recalls her stash of glass and computes which layers of glass are needed to replicate that very same colour. Ruth had her palette of tiles. They were colours she had mixed through layering and firing. Mid-July we met at Ruth's studio. Light beamed through her studio window. Groupings of vessels were organised on her desk. I was immediately drawn to the acid green vessels emerging from a curved base of turquoise blue. A belt of saturated cadmium reds and oranges darted up the shaft of the vessel. The incidental light of the fortuitous time of day only added to their splendour, enlivening all vessels that met its gaze. Looking at a collection of Munt pieces, Ruth noted the dark grey came out light in the stretch, the physics of colour, gravity. Added to the management of predicted colour was the stretch. Stretch colours marked the placement of two separate and distinct pieces of colourful glass and their subsequent fusion and stretch. The stretch is involved in the drop that occurs in the kiln, and here I sidestep the technical aspect of Ruth's practice in a bid to retain a level of esotericism, for her originality is rooted in methods that took years to generate and master. The fusion creates a beautiful gradient of colours that slowly transition between two hues. Her pieces at times capture densities of colours that then transition to lighter shades that still evidence opacity. In tandem with producing the palette, there was also the interplay between transparency and opacity, between stretch and fusion, between pattern and colour. I stared at the 17 vessels that sat before me, understanding for the first time the involvement of her practice, all the anomalies, all the factors that informed just a single vessel, and those factors were the ones that produced a vessel that emerged from the kiln. There were a series of treatments that followed this moment, including cutting, sanding, polishing, during which the fragility of the medium could express itself fully. Ruth explained that she is excited to come downstairs in the morning, describing opening the kiln as a big excitement, but also noting, you have lots of work to do after. It's very distressing when something goes wrong. We might overlook something. Overlooking a problem is worse, or the colours don't come out, as you hoped, especially in the stretch. And it can be just one colour. I've put pink on top of yellow and it's not worked, but that's part of the excitement. It gets harder when you've got a commission or a tight schedule, but experiments, in experiments, mistakes can be excitement. Our practices were meshworks that seemed to gather on the quest for colour and weaken and disperse in different directions on the matter of the processes we used to achieve that colour. Ruth's practice utilised numbers and layering, whilst mine used selecting and mixing. We both looked to the landscape, or perhaps noticed the landscape. We were sensitive to the landscape and its changing hue. In June, I told Ruth that I could read her Munt vessels, that I could see her references. Before they were colour and light, but now, through learning about her practice and seeing her references, both in her paperwork and in the Bede Goyaun, in reality, due to our walk together across the landscape, the vessels took on a different meaning, which led me to ask Ruth if her colours are mnemonics whether they trigger memories, and whether, once she's achieved a certain colour, if it is always and forever equated with that place. Ruth explains that the pieces capture the colours I see each year when I come back. Yes, there are beautiful sunsets, machlig, at Munt, but each year I have a different feel, a different vision. Each year there's a different Munt. It's not always the same. I like to think of Munt as having a rolling programme. It changes. Thinking through her remarks, I latched on to her observation that I have a different feel, Dween Tamelon Gwahanol. The way Ruth put it emphasised the embodied aspect of the feeling. Rather than picturing a human as a mass of emotions and feelings, as an entity that goes through different temporal states, and therefore emotional states, the description that she made, that she had a different feel, seemed to separate the cognitive from the body, and suggest that the body itself was felt as a historical phenomenon. I thought through my own practice and observed that my paintings are painted in specific emotional states and the works are better if the painting is produced amongst those feelings. Painting over several days is a necessity with larger pieces 
but smaller paintings are more concise, more exact, and more faithful to my message if they are painted in a day. Ruth's acknowledgement that she, her mind, her body had a different feeling when at Munt, year after year, acknowledged the human qualities that fed into her interpretation of colour. Things called to her differently, for she was different. Munt changed too, there was no denying that. Nonetheless, she reminded me she consistently went in July. Therefore, it was not necessarily a seasonal change in nature that she witnessed. There were some parameters to her experience that meant that there were certain expectations about what she would be seeing at Munt. Ruth shared, once you start looking in nature, it changes either way. Kenevan is that feel for the place. If you love something, you see something different. Her sensitivity to her own somatic engagement with the world resonated with my own practice. The emotional had to be a factor in this engagement, and emotional responses and the act of valuing those as a feature of an artistic practice is something I correlate with an expressionist mindset, which led me to inquire about her artistic influences. Later that very June, I headed to Paris. I was searching for André Duran and Maurice de Vlaminck, and I found the Delaunays. Ruth had noted in one of our meetings that the Sonia Delaunay exhibition at the Tate had a huge impact on her practice. As I entered the Pompidou Centre, I was ready and prepped to look and spend time with the Delaunays, particularly Sonia, and to open myself up to Ruth and her relationship with Sonia's work. At the Pompidou Centre, both Robert and Sonia are displayed side by side. The closeness of their style and preoccupation with colour demonstrates a synergy between the couple that speaks of a deep love and shared identity. Sonia, like Robert, embraced non-objectivity and used colour to elicit form. Language and mathematics were all caught up in the opinions Sonia shared. She noted that painting is a form of poetry, colours are words, their relations, rhythms, a completed painting, a completed poem. She was always attracted to colour and brilliance, fond of mathematics at school. She later observed colour was the hue of number. Whilst the latter statement is perhaps a little too abstract for me to fully grasp, I found the juxtaposition of hue and number delightfully compelling. Through Ruth's work, the statement took on a different meaning, a literal meaning. For Ruth, colour is a literal number. Sketching the following day, whilst sat in the gardens of Versailles, where the Allée Royale crosses the Allée d'Artemme, I struggled with the vast areas of verdant green hedgerows, which meant that the palace and the sculptures could not all be fitted on a sketchbook page if I was to faithfully follow the way reality was organised before me. This was when it struck me that I could gather the things of interest before me and determine myself where they sat on the page, like the Delaunays, who seemed to obliterate perspective and organise structures of relevance, people and crowds of interest to their liking on the canvas. I drew Versailles, and then I drew the sculptures that called for me. I was no longer faithful to their true size. Instead, I put emphasis on the places that interested me. An Orson Welles interview echoed in my mind. Speaking about reality and the medium of film, he said films are best when they manage poetry by reducing the element of reality and introducing something which is an invention of the filmmaker. Perhaps the paintings I create have always played with reality. My colour combinations offer worlds anchored by structures and forms of the landscape, but I've always been liberal with my interpretation, not faithfully portraying everything, often creating gaps. Perhaps that was one of the many attractions of Munt for me, when looking Towards the church, towards the mount, towards the sea, there was never anything I felt compelled to leave out, nothing to free and dissolve from the landscape. I could absorb it all. If drawing is a language and reality, that is to say landscape, things, me, you, is a type of syntax, then the artist is under no obligation to parrot, recite or imitate the grammatical flows of things. Artists are not obliged to provide verbatim scrawl. Instead, space is given here for the artistic skill that lies in the ability to utilise the language of drawing to generate comparative syntax, to flesh out and make real and pressing the many different felt realities that we partake in as solo entities in fluctuating, pulsating worlds. Perhaps my drawings and sketches would pursue this direction with more vigour. At Versailles, the intricate leaf pattern and tall Versailles hedges did not call to me. But the hundreds of windows and the sprawling, grandiose steps, the pathos of the marble sculptures, beckoned to me. A steward noticed my intense observation of a sculpture that he stood by as I sat on the cut stone bench in the midday sun. C'est joli, he remarked with a kind smile. What I was depicting was nothing less than reality, but it was mine, my process reality, my felt reality. 
It all started with an introduction to Kinevan, and through our dialogue I made a journey through translation to mathematics and grammar. I travelled from Bunt to Paris and had an epiphany somewhere in the in-between. I was given a word that recognised my connection, my relationship, Perthinus, to the land, Tedworth. A wash, a hue, a palette, a spectrum, no, no, they would not do, they could never do justice to a sea of blues.